Welcome to Rules of the Game podcast. My name is Butch Porter. I'm your host, and we are here at, on the front porch of Dodona Manor, the home of George C. Marshall in beautiful downtown Leesburg, Virginia. And with me today is the one and only, the illustrious Phyllis Randall, chair of the Loudoun, Cham- uh, Loudoun, Loudoun County uh, uh, Board, Board of Supervisors. Of Supervisors. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's a beautiful day. Beautiful day. Great day to be here. Thanks for having me. And, and I did not call you chairman. You did not call me chairman. Right. I appreciate that. You're I welcome. appreciate that. It is chair. It's the least <laughs> I could do, not call you chairman. So you, uh, you uh, had a law change for that, for that purpose, right? I did. So in my first term, it was by law you had to be a chairman. Right. And I was surprised at that, and I asked Virginia's um, General Assembly to change that. And it didn't even go out of the committee. They said no. And, I, and when I asked why, they said, well, to be, for a woman to call herself chairwoman or chair would cause gender confusion. And I said, okay. I'm not at all confused about my gender. I know what You're my gender confused. is. I'm yeah. not at all. Good. So maybe, um, you know, maybe calling me chairman would be a little more confusing. So now we went back down this year and they did change the law. And so now I, uh, a chair of a county or any board can be chair, chairman, chairwoman, or chairperson. But and I choose to go by chairman. You weren't the first woman chairman. In, in Loudoun, or I was you? not. No, I was you not. The first woman chairman in Loudoun was a woman named Del Poland Myers. Del Poland Myers. That's right. That's right. That's right. Who called me the day after my election to congratulate her, me, and has been so so kind to me ever since. I'm, I'm a fan. She's a property rights person. Yeah, yeah, I love property yeah, rights yeah. people, as you probably know. I am the first person of color to be a chair at large in, in the whole in state the, in the Commonwealth's history. Yes. That's awesome. Yep. So, um, so which one of those do you think? probably gives you the most pride is it the first woman or is it being a woman chair or is it being uh, the first person of color chair or? well I don't know if I take pride in either one I, I have enormous gratitude sure. uh, for both those things because there were so many people who came before me to make it possible for me as a woman and a person of color to even run for the office and so I wake up every morning just with overwhelming gratitude about that. So I don't know that it's, it's not really my pride to have. It's my gratitude to have and it's their pride because they, they set that path that I was able to walk on. Oh, absolutely. Um, so where are you originally from? You're not from here, are you? So my father was in the military. So I was born okay. in Stuttgart, Germany. Stuttgart. Uh, and we lived quite a few different places before we finally settled in Denver. So I was raised in Denver, Colorado. Denver, it's a beautiful place. It's beautiful and really cold. From October to May. It's cold from October to May in Denver, Colorado, which is, I, I, you know, as a child, I never remember trick-or-treating um, without having a coat over my Halloween outfit. There was no reason to have no a Halloween outfit. No one's going to see that. it. No one's going to see it. They never saw what I was because I had a coat on because it was Halloween in Denver. Yeah, and Louisiana was still too hot. <laughs> we got four seasons down there. It's almost summer, summer, still summer, and Christmas. Right? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a whole, whole opposite uh, thing. One thing I remember flying into Denver one time, I didn't realize that half of Colorado was just like Kansas. Oh, oh like yeah, until it's you flat. get to oh, Denver, no. yes, no, it's, it's just, just flat. Pfft. It's flat. There's nothing. It's crazy. There's mountains. There's flat. There's my, there's my mother's house. That's how it goes. <laughs> so what <laughs> brought you? Goes. What brought you here? So I married a man who was from Williamsburg, okay. and he really wanted to come back to the east. And if you live in Denver, when you grow up, you want to move to California. It's just what you do. It's like the Mecca. So we had back and forth and back and forth. And finally he said, come to the east with me. Come east with me. Come to Virginia. And if you just hate it, after two years, we right. can move and go to California. So I had in my head that I was going to hate it no matter right. what. And we were here for about two to three months before I realized he had just won the argument <laughs> because I absolutely loved it here and, I, and I've loved it ever since. Did you have that experience where like the family comes in town to visit you in DC and then uh, the first time you go to DC and you do the DC thing and the second time you, you go maybe for a little while, the third time you drop them off, the fourth time you like, take a bus, the no. fifth time you don't bother. Every or, time family every time. comes and even by myself, I love DC. You love to go into and DC. And you can't do enough. I mean, I still so have much. not done all the Smithsonian's. And if you're like me and you love museums, a Smithsonian takes you the entire day to get through sure. because sure. you're reading one everything, yeah. one Smithsonian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're reading, every, and of course, when I came here, I thought the Smithsonian was one building. I did not know the Smithsonian was like this multitude of. Right. So I, I, when I, when I have a day off, I will take the day and just go do a Smithsonian by myself. 
I never get tired of it. Do you, um, I know you don't have a lot of free time, <laughs> um, but um, what, do you, what do you do with your free time? What are your hobbies? What are your interests? I have very little free time. Um, but the truth is, so again, I do a lot of reading. I, I haven't had a chance to read for pleasure as much, but I have done some reading for pleasure um, very recently. Um, and I will, as I said, I will go to a museum. If, I, if you give me a museum, you, you've lost me, right? I'm going to be in there for the entire day, pack a lunch, you know, to do that. Sure. Reading everything that I see. I also uh, work out pretty, pretty religiously. Almost every day I make sure I work really? out. Yeah. Oh, I have to do that. I'm so. not even going to respond to that. Because <laughs> I, I should, right? At least like once a year. It keeps me sane. It, it does. Does it? Is it a stress reliever? It is. I mean, I've worked out already this morning. I, I do my aerobics in the morning and my weightlifting in, in the evening. So what made you get into, you know, politics of all things? That's not a stress reducer. Right? It's not. So it, this is the uh, God, uh, God's honest God's true story. Honest. There you go. When we went to D.C., um, I was running around like a crazy person, like, take my picture. Sure, sure. We went on the Capitol, the steps of the Capitol, and I had um, a Paul on the road to Damascus moment. Did you really? I really did. I, 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 I had come here and decided that I was going to go to medical school. Okay. And uh, had been accepted to Howard University's medical school, and I was excited about that. And I got on the, on the Capitol steps, no kidding, I got tears in my eyes and said to my husband, I want to do policy, public policy, for the rest of my life. And he said, everyone who comes up on these steps has this moment, Phyllis. This is normal. Like, no, you don't. And I, yeah, and I was like, no. It's not necessary. No, I really do. I want to do policy. This is what I want to do. I don't, I don't want to. I want to do this. So when you say policy, what did, what did you mean then? You and know what, what? I wasn't now? sure what I meant then. Right. I, um, as you know, I'm, I am by profession a mental health therapist sure. that worked in the, in, um, the prison set setting, so I worked for offenders. And so what, for whatever reason, I have just been given a heart, I was given a heart for both adolescent and adult offenders right. because they have become such throwaway people that people think are you know, dismissive from society forever. And so a lot of my policies that I've worked on before I became chair of the county was um, uh, policies that impacted offenders. I was the chair of the State Board of Corrections under Terry McCulloch, and I, and I tried to move a lot of uh, programming into the, the, our prison system and our jails. So whether that was more GED programming, whether that was um, information on why, you, why, you, why did you use substances, so um, um, substance abuse programs, I really want to move programming into the incarcerated settings, knowing that the vast majority of people who go to prison or jail get out. And so to have them at a better place when they get out than when they went in was what God gave me a heart for. And what I did for many, many years, as well as working as a mental health therapist in the incarcerated settings, I also was the chair of the State Board of Corrections for the purpose of moving programming into our incarcerated facilities. Yeah, so so how did that end up translating into, in, like, back then? I mean, you, you worked on health care policy. Sure. So for years and years, um, um, I was one of the people who really worked on the issue of re-enfranchisement, okay. which is having people who have, um, are out of prison get their voting rights back. Sure. Um, for years and years, I worked on re-entry programs. So how does somebody come out of jail and re-enter society? Uh, uh, what does that look like? We started a program in Prince William County Jail where we had um, business owners and people from the chamber and the community come in and do mock interviews with prisoners who are, go are about to be released so that they can figure out how to get a job and get back in society. Sure. Do you think that, um, do you think in general that uh, felons should have their voting rights restored as a matter of course, or do you think it should yes. be a special? No, as a matter no. of course. And this is why, you know, I've talked about this so many times. Um, we have um, a criminal justice system that we've all kind of signed on to, that this is the criminal justice system that we use. Judges send down an edict on how long somebody's going to serve. Sure. Um, when that person is released from jail, that is because the criminal justice system says they release. Some judge said, you get 10 years, you get 15 years. If the judge thinks they should be there longer, then leave them there longer. But once they get out, the first thing we should try to do is fold them back in society in every way possible. And in my opinion, to decide that we're going to further punish them by not giving them their voting rights back is in, in a way some kind of strange double jeopardy, right? They've, 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 they've committed, they, they've served their time. Right. So why are we trying to further punish them? 
And really what we should be trying to do, what we hope to do, is to fold them back into society in every healthy way possible. And so that is, can you vote? What job are you going to have? I mean, it just in every way, we want them to not reoffend. That's well, the sure. goal. And so to fold them back into society. So I've always, I've always been baffled by why we try to continue to punish people by not giving their license back, not allowing them to vote. They, they've served their time. Or carry a weapon. Um, they, well, and, and depending on what that might be, maybe that too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that too. They've served their time. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, if you're going to do one, then it makes sense to do and the let's, other. And let's have a discussion about all, absolutely. Let's have a discussion. So what is it that, how would you say, and you can talk about this historically or, because labels are problematic, like almost as a matter of course, but how would you describe yourself politically? Are you a liberal, a progressive, a Democrat, all three, neither, what? How would you describe yourself? I am um, left of center. Left of center. I like it. I like it. I'm that's, right of center. We'll get along just that's fine. That's how I just describe myself. Left so, of center. So why? I mean, what what is it that makes um, what is it that makes someone like in general you think left of center versus right of center? You know, I think part of it is how I grew up. So okay. um, I grew up in a in a in um, two things. One, a military family. Sure. And two, um, with with faith being at the center of my life. Yeah, I was going to ask, do you, do you go to church regularly, or which one do you go to? Uh, do I go to church regularly? Sure. I go to church, I go to a church building regularly when we're not in COVID, and I go to church every single day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I building. go to church in my car, I go to church in my house, I all go to church time. all the time. I go to church at the grocery store, I go to church all the time. Were you, were you in a, did you have a, a, a church going family growing up? Did oh, my, go, my, like, my, the my, my grandfather that? was the head deacon of New Hope Baptist Church. Okay. And um, growing up, everyone knew and that, that was in Denver. That was in Denver. Everyone knew that I was one of Deacon Henderson's grandchildren. And so there's 27 of us and none of us had names. Like we were all just Deacon Henderson's grandchildren, That's right? Great. And if somebody wanted to identify us, they would say, you're Deacon Henderson's grandchild, aren't you? I say, I am. Which, which child? And I would say my mother's Billie Jean, because my name never mattered. My grandfather's name and my mother was Billie Jean. Sure. That's how we were identified. I mean, I don't think, I don't think any adult called me by my name for most of my, my childhood. I was Deacon Henderson's granddaughter, and if they really wanted to go deep, I was Billie Jean's daughter. Right. Of, of the Deacon Henderson one granddaughter. Of those, one of those. Uh, one of those, yes. <laughs> one of those. So they, and, they, and they say, yeah, yeah. So, you, so you, are, are you Bobby's daughter? Are you Charles's daughter? Are you Billy Jean's? That's how we were identified. It sounds like a really tight family. Oh, and incredibly. I have an incredibly, incredibly tight family. Um, and it's wonderful. My, my, I have cousins who I am very close to. All of my siblings. We are in, tight to the point of maybe being a little imagined and unhealthy. But growing up like that, um, you know, when you grow up in a, when you grow up in a, a, a home where, where church, um, and not just church, but Christ is a pivotal part of your life. It's interesting because when you're a Democrat and you mention that you are a person of faith, what happens right now with me is people in your side of the political aisle always say to me, Oh, you're virtual signaling. You're virtue signaling. It's such an amazing moment when that happens. I, if I talk about my faith at all, I'm virtue signaling. And I think if you have any idea how much time I spent in New Hope Baptist Church, you know, at the literally the deacon meetings, because that's where Grandpa was at the deacon meetings, sure. or Wednesday night prayer, or going to visit the sick and shut in after service on Sunday. It, you know, that's, that's my life. I will say from my point of view as a conservative who loves to make fun of virtue signaling um it's not normally christ and church stuff that we oh, see that's what i get it from that's what i get it that's what really? i really that's interesting oh, yeah. well oh, yeah. i would i would just say that i didn't even know what it I was until someone, i heard that i didn't even know what it was and so i was like what is that i, I put a scripture the, up and somebody said it's your well, virtue signaling right well it is a i mean all of us virtue signal and none it's of it's never, virtue signaling it's never you know it's never uh I mean, by definition, it's it's uh, the the way I've heard it expressed is someone someone who is a virtue doesn't have to virtue signal, right? We just go on about our day and we profess what we believe to be true. And if someone, I think what happens is though, like for instance, if I were to ask somebody uh, from you know right of center, 
uh, what their politics was, and they said, raised in a military home and, and grew up in a, in a very religious, churchy home, that would make sense too, right? I mean, that, yeah. that, that, that yeah, I would. don't think that would, that yeah. would. So maybe is that what keeps you in the center or is that what keeps you on the left? If that makes any sense. Um, that's such an interesting question. It's such a healthy question. Thank you for asking it. I think it's what keeps me both, to be honest. I think what keeps me centered, not centered, in, pol yeah, not in sure, politics, like that. but centered, right. is Christ first and my family second. Um, that just keeps me centered. But growing up, the things that my grandfather, my grandmother, my parents taught me, the things we did after church, the really the visiting the sh sick and shut in, the making sure that, that people who were not as blessed as I was had food to eat, the, the sharing of resources, even when the resources were slim, sure, were, is what keeps me left of center. Well, I would say, I mean, it's, it's possible that someone could be right of center sure. and still have those same. Sure, they could, they could. Well, do you think that, I'm, I'm just trying to picture, how many grandchildren were you one of, did you say? 27. Okay, I mean, that's getting, <laughs> that's getting rarer. It is getting weird. Right? It is. So um, do you think that it's possible that smaller families or more disparate families has made it harder to create that sort of... Maybe. Uh, Unfortunately, maybe. So I, we, my, my cousins and I, we work really hard to stay connected. Yeah. Um, and to have even our children know each other, it is so important. It is so important. But yeah, smaller families make, it does make it harder. It I got into a discussion not too long ago about the concept of uh, like somebody put a meme up and it was something like uh, you know when when a democrat wants to feed the whole feed the homeless it's or, or feed the hungry it's it's socialist but uh, when a conservative wants to do it it's it's christ-like and charitable or whatever which I, I thought was interesting do you think it's do you think it's different uh, when people choose to do it and when they participate as individuals and as families, as communities, to do it, to share those scarce resources than when the government takes it on? Do you think there's a difference there? Or do you think it matters? What a great question. Um, I think that there are things that I see in our society that every nonprofit in the world working together could not handle. There are some things that the, only the government can do and, and, and thus should. I think, though, that there are times when the government, well-meaning, can get in the way sure. of, of people being more successful. Can you give me an example? Well, I can. So my husband was talking about when he was, my husband grew up in, in almost abject poverty. Mm -hmm. And when he would work and save his money and things like that, and his, and his mother was receiving, um, she was receiving what we now call TANF, what we then call welfare. And at one point, oh, sure. um, they, they, for some reason, looked at her, his bank account and realized that he had money in his bank account from all the jobs he worked, and that if she were to re continue to receive in her check, he had to spend his money in his bank account. How illogical is that? That is completely ridiculous. Sure. That is the government getting in the but way. It's still, it's still it's like still if you like turn that. 65, yep. you have to stop working yeah, because it's, it's, you make it's, too much it's, money it's for ridiculous. social security. Having said that, um, the, there are times, many times, when I, when I know that, I mean, as we, where we're at right now, you know, all the nonprofits in the world could not do what needs to be done um, in, in, at, at this time. We need government assistance. Do you think that, um, do you think it's a function of, of, of time, like over time, those nonprofits not being as involved because, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why something like that happens, right? I mean, we've put, I saw a number the other day, $37 trillion into, you know, the Great Society. And there's been arguments made that it's not really that much better off than it was then. Yeah. So it hasn't yeah. been, do you feel like that's in general been it's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove it yeah. would be worse without it, yeah. right? And I get that. But do you think that there was, there are better ways to I do think that? that the, I think that the government gives with one hand and can take us away with the other. Right. And when you do it at the same time, then it's going to be harmful in the end. Um, for instance, um, I think that, you know, when we, not that long ago, when, when there was redlining policies about where sure. people could live, um, it created 
it created whole communities that were going to be stuck in poverty no matter what. And so the government stuck, sticks, sticks them in a, in, a, in a Cabrini Green setting, sticks them in poverty, and then gives them a check. Yeah. That, that, right, right. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like what, 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 some what, what's, 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 what, what, some obvious flaws. Yeah. And I think it's well meaning, sure. but some obvious flaws. Um, well, what is, what is I, you know, it, it's funny because when I was growing up, we had, we had, um, when I was pretty young when Reagan was in office, but I remember when he did the feeding program, the feeding, the food that they put into the feeding program was so unhealthy that people would eat the food that the government gave you and then got less healthy because of it, right? I mean, we used to call the big block of cheese that came in Reagan cheese. <laughs> Reagan <laughs> that was cheese. the word we gave it. And it wasn't real cheese. It was some kind of condensed yellow, you know, heart cheese attack food. in a box, yeah, right? Cheese food. So right. I'm like, so sometimes you're like, don't help me. Like, don't help me with this heart attack. But it was also an effort to do the right thing. Sure. How do you feel like the relationship between local government, state government, and the federal government, has your opinion of that relationship changed since you've been the chair? So I say this not because I'm supposed to say it. I say that with, with all seriousness. Um, I think the most powerful government job is local government because we really are the government that's closest to the people. Well, sure. Now, that doesn't mean I may not run for something else because truthfully, if, as you get into you another heard it here office, first, folks, she's running as you for get to another else. office, you may be able to impact a larger number of people. The only reason for me to run for a higher office, because I'm not sure I consider it higher, is because I can impact a higher number of people. Let me tell not you. Not because the job itself is more important. There's some things that you and I may not agree on, uh, but that would be one that we would have to agree on yeah. because I do think that I do think that um, your average Congress critter, for instance, and I call them critters because it's a gender neutral, uh, uh, your average Congress person represents what, 700,000 yeah. people, yeah. give or take. Yeah. Um, and most people don't know their Congress person. They right? don't. And uh, not, they don't know who the chair, chair is either though. <laughs> well, true. You know, it, it's kind of a dichotomy. It's kind of, I mean, be, being that we live in Loudoun County, all politics is national in Loudoun County. Yeah. That's my running yeah. joke. But, um, but most people don't know what their town is doing or yeah. their county is doing, right. and they're yeah. too focused on D.C. Yeah. But yeah, I, absolutely. I, do you think that? Do you think the federal government has, given the fact that, given that sort of lack of touch and lack of, you know, uh, of at least the potential of more contact, uh, do you think the federal government? Um, should have less of an influence on our lives than it does? I think, um, I don't think the federal government has that much influence on our lives, to be honest. I, so I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't think, I think, no, not more, no, okay, but I don't yeah. think they have that much. I think people per, per, um, perceive that because the federal sure. government is what you see in the news every night. That's right. The federal government is, you know, what you see on, in election season. I do not have enough money to run commercials. So you're worried about do. Richmond more than D.C. On I'm, I, day. well, first of all, I'm about Loudoun, but yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I mean, worried, as far yeah, as that. Yeah, the, I the, would be. Because I don't think, I don't think, I mean, listen, for the things that really impact people's lives, you know, people want to get out of the traffic on Route 7. That's me. People want their light on, the, the street light well, on the side of the building. You, well, that's li this local government. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. I'm just it's joking. just me. It's just, just her. me. Just call Phyllis. <laughs> Should we give him your number? <laughs> Most people have it, unfortunately. <laughs> Many people have it. Um, I won't, I promise. But, um, but, but local government, I mean, the street light in front of your house is local government, sure. right? So I don't think people realize how much uh, impact on your day-to-day -day lives is local government and not federal. Yeah, so, but the federal government has so much awful money though like if they don't if they're not an influence in our lives why do they have so much they money? have well i think the, I don't, much of I don't, our money i don't know if those two things are always com um, compatible well they, they, they should they do be have a, they do have a lot of money they i'm not saying they have no influence but on your day-to-day -day existence local government has more well local government does i mean and but most people um unless they own a lot of property uh are paying more to the federal government than they are to the state sure and they're that is true. In many cases, yeah, pay more true. of the state than that they are the that, county. That's true. Except um, for Donald Trump, who seems to not be paying much of anything to anybody, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I have no evidence that he broke the law, Phyllis. 
I, um, I expected. Which is the worst part know, of the whole discussion. You know, that well, he, sure. No FSC broke the law. But, but that's you know, true? it was the, you know, uh, Mitt Romney, like, literally changed his taxes to pay more taxes. And we yeah. still raked him over yeah. the coals. Yeah, well, you know, the fact that, the fact that Donald Trump paying $750 a month more than, you know, a kid working in, in Terrace Teeter did not break the law is actually a humongous problem with the laws. Maybe. No, I'm not. Absolutely. I don't want to, yeah, yeah, arguments over tax law <laughs> is probably not our purview today. That's a good thing. But what do you think that, um, what do you think that the next, I mean, the election's going to be here within a couple weeks of this yeah, airing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank God. <laughs> Don't hey, we want, by don't, the way, don't we do, want you, this done? do you use snooze for 30 days on uh, on Facebook? No. Yeah, it's my favorite tool. Uh, no. So you can snooze people for 30 days. And like just a few days ago, snooze for 30 days meant snooze till oh, after the election. Wow, so yeah. it's been very, yeah. a very effective tool. That's very zen. <laughs> very <laughs> zen. <laughs> how, do you think, how do you think our conversations, I mean, I know they're bad. Let's just start with our conversations yeah. are bad. Unfortunately. Uh, very true. few people are having conversations these kinds of conversations. Yeah. I'm not bragging, but very few people very are having few. these kinds of conversations. Which is why this was important to me to join you today. Well, to no, I appreciate it. Um, I've, uh, the last Democrat politician I had on was Kristen Umstad. So, you know, I don't, you know, she's too easy to get along with, frankly. She's just too terribly nice. How, long, how long ago was that? It's about a year ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So she, had, she was new to the board. I told her, I, I, I will call her Madam Mayor. I can't call her supervisor. It I just know. doesn't. It took me a long time, too, actually. To Chair get is easy. <laughs> I called her Madam Mayor for a full year. It took me a long time to get used so, to um, no, how do you So how do you think we improve our conversations? I don't, I don't know the best way as a mass to do it. We can all do little things. I think what you just did was really important, and that's why, and I caught it, and I appreciate it when you said, maybe not tax policy right now, because that was, that was, good, that was good of you. I appreciated that. There, you know, the truth is this. It's complicated. Well, it's not, no, it's not just as complicated. Taxes there's just are, some things that people so are not parts. going to agree on. Well, they're true. just not. So we can have That's a conversation true. about them, but this is where the mental health therapist part of me comes in. Yeah. The purpose of having a conversation is not to force you to agree with me or me to agree with you. The purpose of having a conversation is to hear and be heard. Well, sure. So many people go into the conversation deciding that if you don't end up agreeing with them, then it's not worth talking to you. Well, let me ask you something. Versus, can you hear me, can I hear you? Let me ask you one thing then. What is it that you've heard, I'm gonna kind of put you on the spot, but I'm happy to answer the same question. What is it that you've heard over the last six months that you didn't expect to hear and, and or felt you needed to hear from your compadres on the other side? So I can talk about locally it's a little different because locally it's, it's Either usually- Either way, it doesn't matter. But locally it's usually, land use or something like that. It's oh, not no, I'm talking about You're like, talking about really yeah, yeah, deep, the, deep, deep stuff. and important stuff. The hard stuff. The stuff um, that we're not supposed to talk about because we're yeah, all yeah. not going to get along or whatever. Um, I have come to believe that the president's um, efforts in the Middle East have been not only correct, but but move the ball more than most presidents. Fruitful. In the Middle East. For, for Middle East policy. And let me tell um, you, that's completely unexpected by me. Yep. Like I didn't see any yep. of that coming. Yep. It has been yep. almost. That's that I will. Almost I Almost mean, impressive, right? <laughs> um, actually, yeah, uh, his, and, and, I, and I'm being very narrow. His Middle, <laughs> his Middle East policies have been fruitful. Why? Um, you know, it's interesting. I think he's let, he's probably let the people who want, and I'm not talking about Jared Kushner, I'm talking about people who really know what they're doing. He let them do it, and he did, I don't think he knew a lot about it himself, so he didn't really want to dive into it with both feet, and he let people just do their jobs on that. You know, it's funny. I didn't vote for our current president, and, and I, I still haven't, I can't vote for Joe Biden, but I, I, I haven't made up my mind what I'm, what I'm going to do. But when he was elected, I was happy for one reason. He's the first president to ever, well, he's the first businessman to become president, right? I mean, he's the first businessman that had never been elected to office, never had a military commission, never had a judgeship. He's the yeah. first. Yeah. There's only two in American history that has neither of those three things. Yeah. that even got a major party nomination yeah. and he's the president. So I thought, even though I don't like him, even though I didn't vote for him, even though I wasn't a fan of his rhetoric, of his his style, the sound of his voice, and all of it, I, 
I thought maybe a business guy who has at least seen some modicum of success yeah. can surround himself with people who can do yeah. the job because that's what even a modicum of good leadership in the business world does. You surround yourself with good people and, and they do most of the work and, yeah. and you just kind of keep it all together. Um, I think in one area he pulled that off. I, think I don't know area, that he yeah. pulled it off in all the no. other ones, no, I think that's but in the Middle East I he did. I think in the Middle East he did. And, and it's interesting because when I woke up the next morning after the election and I found out Donald Trump had won, I was, my blood ran cold. And it's not be because of all the things I knew about him. It wasn't, it wasn't the politician in me wasn't what made me go, oh my God, the mental health therapist in me was made me go, oh yeah, my God, because, um, because I honestly know what a narcissist actually is and what that actually looks like in action. And there's two, there's two diagnoses you never want to put in power. And one is what's now called antisocial personality disorder, and the other one is narcissism. Those two personalities you don't want to put in power. So I was, I was very worried, and I was very worried and, and literally prayed that I'd be wrong. I was not. Well, I, I don't know that all, I had different fears. Um, I just assume everybody that's president is gonna have a, just, a, just a smidgen of narcissism and he was just a, you know, an order of magnitude worse. But I will say, <laughs> I will say that, that my concerns, the main concerns I have uh, are executive overreach. Yeah. And since every president since 1980 has overreach executively, yeah. almost yep. like I, by I order of magnitude. Yep. Yep. And you can look at the, like yep. every one has been worse yep. than the one before. Um, he hasn't done worse on that than I expected. Yeah, you know, that, I think that's, well, I think. I mean, look at COVID. I, we, we know that the governors are in charge now, right? I mean, the, the president did not overreach his authority. No, he didn't overreach with COVID. on COVID at all. I can't say he did anything over. The president had, and, and we, we may not want to go here, the president had no national strategy and still doesn't. And when I heard him say, that we would have herd, he, he, hit, he meant herd, you know, immunity. Herd immunity, he yeah. He said herd mentality. And for the fact that did he- Did he say herd mentality? Yeah, that's he fine. did. But that's fine. That's, that's we just, have that too. That, that's, that's fine. The fact that he doesn't know that herd immunity means millions, millions of people are, are dead, really, really, really just made, made me scared. So, you know, yes, it's the governors, but that's where a, a federal government response actually matters. So we talked about- Well, when, it does, when the government but I think the government, be the government, the federal government can respond in an overreaching way, in a negative yeah, way. Yeah, they could, but they didn't. Like he, he could have responded in an over. In, I don't in, know in that way. I would want an overactive. Uh, government. I, I don't want an overactive government. I federal want an government. active government. He didn't act almost at sure. all. Sure. So yeah, so there's a difference. I will say something that one of my friends put on Facebook, Republican put on Facebook, really recently. I thought it was a to to, to your point you just made. He said, you know, as as. The president has talked about how he may not leave office and how he would have his own electors and all that. It's Somebody wrote, if one man can completely shut down our democracy, do we not believe that maybe we've given the president too much of, of power? And I thought, I think the office has, has had too much power. I think the federal government has had too much power. I, I think my, my order of things is very simple. If the, federal, if the, if the executive has taken on too much power, that's mean, that means Congress has not done his job. If Congress has not done his job, that means that the states have not done their job. And if the states have not done their job, guess who hasn't done their job? The voters. We have not demanded yep. Yep. a balance of powers. Well, I do think I do think that the, For you years. Know, when the when the founding fathers, you know, put put forward three co-equal branches of government, they assumed that the legislative branch would do its job. And I do think that if 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 a president, whomever they may be, gets as much power as we have now. Then, then clearly legislative branches have not done their job. I think it's, I think it's hard, it's hard to see any evidence that Congress has been as has done its job yeah. for the last. I would say since '96, <laughs> like roughly since the yeah, last time they a passed time. a budget. Yeah, it's been a, a, like, a, 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 you mean and, and not an extension, but an actual a, budget. I call them cromnibus, yeah. or you know, yeah. uh, continuing resolution yeah. omnibus. It's bills. ridiculous. Well, look, I, I really. We could talk for hours. We could. I think we should, uh, just not on camera. But no. Uh, but seriously, we uh, we should do this again. Happy to have you next year. Um, well, happy after, to be back after the apocalypse. Happy uh, to be but, back. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks for coming on and uh, and. Oh, can I say one thing? Sure. No. Do what you got to do. One thing that I'm incredibly proud of: Loudoun County. Is this the camera? Loudoun County. We have 
the highest census numbers, um, census response in all of Virginia. We are number one. And big kudos to the town of Lovettsville, who has the highest census response to any town in Virginia. This is the best county in the country. You guys did your thing, Loudoun County. Thank you so much. I completely forgot about the census, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank God Phil's reminding us that there was an actual census this year. Oh, no, I'm chair of the police count, count committee, and that the, the, the nerd in me loved this whole census thing, but we did fantastic. You, you are a nerd if you're nothing else, Phyllis. <laughs> All of our guests here on the show, Phyllis, get to come up with a rule. It could be a rule about conversations about, it could be a rule about, rule for life, it could be a rule for politics, it could be a rule for mental health, it could be a rule for anything. A rule. Okay. Um, when talking about politics in America, you are completely forbidden to use any Nazi analogies. <laughs> I love it. It's uh, there's a rule on the internet about how long it takes to get to get to Nazis in a it, conversation. That, that, that is my, that's I the rule. I can't remember. You so are completely, you can't talk care, about Nazis. You, can, right. to, you can't compare Barack Obama to a Nazi. Or you can't compare Donald, Donald Trump, Trump to a Nazi. You can't Nazi. use yeah. the Nazis killed 10 Dude. million people, That's right. 10 million people. You can't use I Nazi analogies. I mean, the Marxists killed that many too, so we can't do that either. We well, can't I, call I, people I, commies. Listen, I'm, I'm making one rule. You tell me, I got one rule, <laughs> my rule is Nazis. That's the, well, that's I'm, gonna that's count, <laughs> I'm gonna counter and say, we shouldn't just pe call people commies either. I think yeah. either is useful. Yeah. But no, that's a really good rule. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to that okay. one, I promise. All right. But uh, thanks for coming on, and for those who are watching or listening, uh, go have a great conversation, but play by the rules. Thank you.